So good morning, everyone. Hope you are doing well. <clears throat> Today we are going to discuss a very important session on the precocious puberty in girls. We'll do a case-based approach to the evaluation and management of precocious puberty in girls. Of course, it's a very important topic for clinical practice and all the specialty exams as well as for the EM and DNB endocrinology board exams. So let's start right away. So in this particular session, I'll be discussing six case-based scenarios. One will be a detailed case-based scenario where I'll take you through the journey of uh, evaluating and diagnosing and managing a, a case of precocious puberty in a girl. I'll also discuss five other case-based scenarios, which will be for quick diagnosis and evaluation. Uh, I'll be discussing an overview of the TANA staging, which is the sexual maturity rating. Then we'll be defining what we define as precocious puberty in girls. We'll see whether we can call it a complete puberty or incomplete puberty and what scenarios will complete it. Call it a complete and what scenarios will call it an incomplete puberty. We'll look at possible causes, whether it is central, which is gonadotropin dependent, or peripheral, which is gonadotropin independent precocious puberty. We will see what biochemical and radiological workup we should carry out. We'll look at the different causes of central and peripheral precocious puberty. We'll also look at the different treatment options for the same. We will help to identify and rule out the different puberty mimics, which we should not misdiagnose as precocious puberty. We will also look at how to individually approach a case of isolated adenarchy or pubarchy or thalarchy or menarchy. We will look also into the concepts of what we refer to as accelerated growth. We'll also look at how we need to correlate the bone age with the precocity. And we will also look at uh, the one and only cause of the precocious puberty, because in all precocious puberty, you'll expect the children to be tall, but we'll look at the precocious puberty cause for the children who are short with a delayed bone age, which is hypothyroidism. So we'll also be seeing that in one particular scenario. So let's start off with the uh, say scenario number one, which is the detailed scenario. So here we have a seven-year-old girl who was brought by her mother with complaints of progressive development of breast for the last six months. It was not accompanied with appearance of pubic hair or history of vaginal bleed. Although there was a history of vaginal discharge occasionally. Now this can be a relevant history. So uh, always, always ask if there is any history of vaginal discharge, if there is no history of vaginal bleed. It was also noticed that she had a sudden increase in her height over the last six months. So this is specifically noted by the mother. First of all, progressive development of breast and noticed a sudden increase in her height both of which can be significant. Now, other history, which we should always ask to try and rule out the possible causes of central versus peripheral. So she did not have the history of headache, visual disturbances, seizures, head injury, meningitis or encephalitis, cranial irradiation, pain in the abdomen or palpable abnormal masses. Of course, pain in the abdomen, palpable abnormal masses will be for the peripheral causes of precocious puberty and the above all will be for the central causes. She also did not have any symptoms suggestive of hypothyroidism. So again, a very important cause in context of delayed bone age, delayed growth, plus precocious puberty. Also, there was no history of any drug intake or use of estrogen creams because that can also be a precipitating cause. And the child was born at term with normal body weight. So here we are ruling out any possibility of a small for gestational age baby, which can later on uh, again present with the progressive growth. So that all things we need to take into consideration, especially in terms of evaluating for history of precocious puberty. So on examination, the uh, patient's height was uh, 130 centimeters. The girl's height was 130 centimeters, which was falling on the 97th percentile. So clearly the height was more and the weight was 26 kg, which was 75th percentile. Her target height based on her father height of 179 centimeters and mother height of 164 centimeters. We calculated that with height of father minus 13 plus height of mother and we divided the whole by two and we get the target height of 165 centimeters. Now she's already at 130 centimeters, which is falling on the 97th percentile, which is definitely an accelerated growth. She did not have an examination, any cafe or macule, adenoma sebaceum, shagreen patch, neurofibroma, or any bony deformity. So here we are trying to rule out in the history of 
McCurney Albright syndrome, which is one of the causes of peripheral uh, precocious puberty. She had no goiter and deep tendon reflexes were normal. Again, we are trying to rule out in the examination of hypothyroidism. Visual field and acuity were normal. Again, we are trying to rule out any possible central causes. Her tannin staging was P1 and B3. Now, what is this P1 and B3? And let's look at the tannin staging now, which is the sexual maturity rating. So, first of all, we our question in our mind is, is it truly precocious puberty in this case scenario? So first of all, how do we define precocious puberty? Traditionally, it is defined as onset of secondary sexual characters. And here in this lecture, I'm going to talk only about girls. Uh, I'll be doing a separate session of precocious puberty approach in boys before the age of eight years in females. So onset of secondary sexual characters before the age of eight years in females. These limits are chosen to be 2 to 2.5 standard deviation below the mean age of the onset of puberty. So here basically it is, if it is pubarchy or thalarchy before eight years of age, or if it is vaginal bleeding before nine and a half years of age, all of them will be classed as precautious puberty in females. Now, tannin staging as we saw in this particular patient was P1, B3. How do we arrive at this grading? It's very important for us to identify and know in clinical practice how to do the sexual maturity rating or tannin staging. Now, in context of females, this is for the breast development. So the stages in breast development females, stage one is prepubertal with no palpable breast tissue. Stage two is development of a breast bud with elevation of papilla and enlargement of areolar diameter. This stage we also refer to as a stage of papilla elevation. Stage three is a very important stage uh, and that is a primary mound formation. This is enlargement of breast without separation of areolar contour from the breast. This is a very important stage in the uh, uh, development of uh, the breast in females. Stage four, areola and papilla project above the breast, forming a secondary mound. So stage three is primary mound formation, stage four is secondary mound formation. And stage five, recession of the areola to match the contour of the breast. The papilla projects beyond the contour of the areola and the breast. So our patient was at stage three, already at primary mound formation, as we see from the diagnostic staging of our evaluation. For stage two, in if the patient was, for example, stage two, always, always palpate with the help of the thumb and the index finger to rule out lipomastia. In lipomastia, you will not feel any resistance because of the fat, fat, whereas if it is a through breast bed development, you will definitely feel there is a resistance. So that's how we will differentiate from uh, lipomastia versus uh, thalarchy per se, especially at stage two level. From stage two to stage four, so stage two to stage four of the breast development, there approximately is a duration of usually two to two and a half years. And during this, the growth spurt will be approximately 10 centimeters per year, which will be approximately 20 centimeters over the two years. If this gap between stage two to stage four is shortened, then that is suggestive of peripheral uh, precocious puberty. Now, usually by the time of stage four of breast development, menarche is eminent and we'll get menstrual bleeding. So basically the stage two till the onset of menarche, the duration is usually around two to two and a half years. However, if there is discordant in this or the duration is shortened by, say, for example, one year, then we should immediately think about uh, possible peripheral precocious puberty as the cause, not central, because something which is producing high and large amounts of estrogen. By stage four, as I mentioned, which is secondary mound formation, menarche is eminent and growth from here will be limited to five to eight centimeters. Up. So these are all the important stages of breast development in females, which we should aware of uh, in evaluating a patient. What about the pubic hair development in females? Again, this stage is very important. Stage one is pre-pubertal with no pubic hair. Stage two is uh, sparse straight hair along the lateral vulva. Stage three is hair is darker, coarser and curlier, extending over the mid pubis. Again, this stage three is a very important stage in the pubic hair development of the females. Stage four, hair is adult-like in appearance but does not extend to the thighs. And stage five, hair is adult in appearance and extending from thigh to thigh. This we can clearly see. Now, our patient was at stage one, but already we had stage three, which is a primary mound formation in the breast development. And any of them, if it is present before the eight years of age, that is what we label as precocious puberty. So clearly, our patient had the uh, definition, uh, I mean, the def it will definitely fall in the definition of precocious puberty 
what about on the examination so on examination of the vagina of the patient we had a pale and a pink vaginal mucosa now this is a sign of estrogen exposure so vaginal mucosa if it is red and listening that means that there is no estrogen exposure this is a pre pubertal vaginal mucosa however if the vaginal mucosa is pale as in our patient or if there is a history of vaginal discharge as was present in a patient pale or pink for that matter uh, it will be suggestive of estrogen exposure pubertal stage stage uh, status and that is a sign of a uh, uh, pubertal status or uh, on the other hand it may be for uh, remote estrogen exposure like estrogen creams for that matter but vaginal mucosa if pale or pink or if there is a history of vaginal discharge is suggestive of estrogen exposure slash pubertal status how to say that the growth is accelerated we plotted the patient uh, height on growth chart it was at 97 percentile so if it is above 95 percentile that is indicative that growth is accelerated what is the other parameters which we can look at we can look at bone age is more than 120 percent of the height age we we'll look at what was the bone age in this patient in the next slides if bone age minus height age more than 2 years that is also indicative of accelerated growth and then there is a special formula called height standard deviation score for bone age uh, that can also be a marker of the accelerated our patient presented with breast development at 7 years of age which is below the normal reference age for onset of puberty which is 8 years and therefore clearly satisfies the criteria for diagnosis of precocious puberty the children with precocious puberty require further evaluation because we want to prevent any further height loss and that will lead to adverse psychosocial outcome so if they are growing very rapidly the bony fusion will happen more quickly and then their height will stop at a certain level Uh, and they will not be able to reach to the target height in addition we should always exclude the presence of structural disease as a cause of precocious puberty remember if a girl is uh, less than 6 year old and if we are getting findings of central precocious puberty mri is mandatory uh, if it is above 6 years there is always uh, no clear need for doing an mri because in above 6 years of age it is usually idiopathic the pause for the central precocious puberty on the other hand in boys majority of the cases are pathological so if any boy of this age group is having findings pointing towards central precocious puberty mri is mandatory in girls less than 6 years mri is mandatory so we should always try to rule out whether it is isolated thylarchy or if it is a true precocious puberty so the premature breast development in an index child will be due to gonadotropin dependent or independent or premature thylarchy which is a normal variant majority of pre pair children with premature thylarchy present before the age of 4 years usually breast development can go up to stage 3 but is usually non progressive and regresses spontaneously within 6 months to 6 years of diagnosis so that is what is premature thylarchy and will not get the uh, vaginal mucosa pale or pink uh, or evidence of estrogen exposure for that matter and will not get an accelerated growth as we were seeing in our patient so other signs of sexual maturation like pubarchy menarche enlargement of uterus we'll look at the ultrasound criteria later on will be absent further growth velocity will be normal in these children and there will be no advancement in bone age so if this is all present then this is premature thylarchy and it is not precocious puberty so what is the initial lab evaluation which we should do for sure we should do a basal serum lh or luteinizing hormone this is by far a good initial screening test to identify the activation of the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis measurement of basal lh concentration ideally in the morning should use sensitive immuno chemiluminescence assays with a lower limit of detection of less than or equal to 0.1 MIU per ml results are interpreted as follows LH concentrations in the pre pubertal range which is less than 0.2 MIU per ml will be consistent with either a pre peripheral cause of a precocious puberty or a benign pubertal variant such as premature thylarchy where the uh, true precocious puberty is not present or it may be indicative of peripheral precocious puberty so always if the limit is above 0.3 usually then that is only diagnostic of uh, central precocious puberty 
and that has a high sensitivity and specificity in that regard. If it is less than 0.2, it will be with peripheral precocity or with a normal uh, premature thalarchy and not precocious puberty. When you are in the middle range, like from 0.2 to 0.3, then there comes the uh, criteria to try and use a DNRH agonist stimulation test. We'll look at that. In our patient, what was the level? Her baseline level was done and it was 1.34, which is clearly about the 0.3 cutoff uh, for the central precocious puberty. So clearly her clinical signs, clinical symptoms, examination, and now even the biochemistry, it's pointing towards a cause of central precocity. So DNRH agonist stimulation test is needed if we have a dilemma, usually between the range of 0.2 to 0.3 for the LH, or if the clinical picture is discordant with the initial baseline investigations. For example, we get an LH in the prepubertal range, but we are having a clinical picture of uh, suggestive of uh, ongoing uh, pubertal development, then a gonadotropin uh, releasing hormone stimulation test may help differentiate those with a central precocious puberty from those with the benign uh, pubertal variant. Now, this test consists of measurement of serum LH before and administration of before and after administration of GnRH. A GnRH agonist may be used instead of GnRH because a single dose of GnRH agonist has an initial stimulatory effect on the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. This alternative is specifically convenient, where in most countries GnRH is not available. A common protocol which is followed for the GnRH stimulation test is blood is sampled at baseline for LH, FSH, and either estradiol in females, or if it was a male, then a testosterone, but we just consider on the females now. The child is then given a single dose of GnRH at a dose of 100 microgram, or GnRH agonist, luprolide acetate at a dose of 20 microgram per kg. So anyone can be used. Then LH is measured at 30 to 40 minutes post GnRH, or 60 minutes post GnRH agonist. What is the cutoff we have expected, how the results are interpreted? So the peak stimulated LH. So for most LHSH, we can say a value of 3.5 to 5. Usually above 5 MIU per ml defines the upper limit of the normal for stimulated, and this will suggest of a central precocious puberty. So more than 5 MIU per ml. What about the peak stimulated LH to FSH ratio? So children with progressive central precocious puberty tend to have a more prominent LH increase post stimulation. So definitely they will have a higher peak LH to FSH ratio compared to those with non or intermittently progressive or slowly progressive precocious puberty. So again, a peak stimulated LH to FSH ratio can be used to uh, identify progressive uh, central precocious puberty. While a definite diagnostic threshold has not been well defined, a peak LH to FSH ratio of more than 0.66 is typically seen in central precocious puberty, whereas less than 0.66 is suggestive of non progressive precocious. If I talk specifically in terms of age, for less than three years, 0.3 is the cutoff. GnRH stimulated LH more than 9 and the ratio of more than 0.4. Then the general other category, which is 3 to 8, like our patient, 0.2 to 0.3, as I mentioned, but usually uh, more than 5 for the GnRH stimulated LH. I mean, GnRH, uh, GnRH agonist stimulated LH, as we saw in that, and the ratio of more than 0.66. So this is again classifying this test further as per the age category. Now, let's come to serum estradiol. So higher concentrations of estradiol with associated suppression of gonadotropins are generally indicative of peripheral precocity, such as from ovarian tumor or a cyst. Most estradiol immunoassays, however, have a poor ability to discriminate at lower limits of assay between prepubertal and early pubertal concentration. So more sensitive assays and methods for estimating estradiol concentrations are recommended, and usually the recommended to measure the estradiol will be uh, GCMS, which is GRAS chromatography, uh, coupled with tandem mass uh, spectrometry. This distinguishes better between prepubertal and pubertal estradiol concentrations and should be ordered exclusively. So GCMS. 
more than 10 picomole per liter for estradiol is usually suggestive for pubertal stage. If you get a very high value, like more than 100 picomole per liter, usually approximately more than 75 picomole, then that is usually suggestive for peripheral cause of precautionary puberty. So this we are talking in terms of the baseline serum estradiol levels. Her baseline estradiol level was 40 picomole per liter, which was clearly, clearly elevated. Now, we talk about ultrasound finding. If we have an ultrasound pelvis where we see the uterus, when we send the patient to do this evaluation, we should make sure the radiologist is checking the shape, the length, the volume, and the endometrial thickness. So a shape will be typically tubular, length will be less than 3.4 centimeters, volume will be less than 2 ml, and endometrial thickness will be less than 2 millimeter in a pre-pubertal uterus, whereas the shape will be globular, length will be more than 3.4 centimeters, volume will be more than 2 ml, and endometrial thickness will be more than 2 millimeter in a pubertal uterus. So this is another ultrasound uh, findings for differentiation between pre-pubertal and pubertal uterus. What about progressive and slow uh, pre-pubertal status? Again, the criteria is more or less the same. So length of the uterus about 32, volume about 2 ml, endometrial thickness about 2, and shape, pure shape is suggestive of progressive uh, pubertal status. Whereas if it is slowly progressive or if it is pubertal, we will have the other criteria. So also to diagnose and also to see whether it is progressing or it is slow. In our particular patient, her uterus length was 3.8 centimeters. So clearly it was suggestive for pubertal uterus. Now coming to bone age, a significant advance in bone age greater than approximately two standard deviation beyond chronological age is more likely to be indicative of either central precocious puberty or peripheral precocity rather than a benign pubertal variant. So in our particular patient, the bone age was done and it was found to be nine years, two months. So her age was seven at presentation and her bone age was clearly advanced at nine years and two months. Now, this is another very important slide, uh, but that's also the end of my uh, free session. Uh, for this particular topic. So for the access to this full video, of course, in the full video, I will discuss another five case scenarios, plus look, looked at different causes of central versus peripheral, looked at the treatment options. So if you want access to the full video, please subscribe to my lecture series. Uh, all the paid subscribers will be given lifetime access to my existing 61 lectures. They are increasing every a uh, couple of weeks because I'm trying to upload at least every two to three weeks new lectures. So all the paid subscribers will be given lifetime access to all my 61 current lectures, plus all my upcoming new videos in the coming weeks and months. So for subscription details, please email me on mazirules at gmail.com or you can WhatsApp me on uh, 0097155743 The same number is on the Telegram as well. Uh, just a quick overview, uh, in diabetes itself, there are around 19 lectures uh, and you can see the different topics which is covered, different guidelines which are covered. Uh, it is a wide spectrum and it covers all the important aspects necessary in clinical practice as well as exams. There are 10 videos specifically targeting high yield questions and topics, including previous recalls of the exams which are uh, recurrently asked in the specialty exams, European board exams and the MRCP. So there are almost 10 videos specifically targeted for that. There is a recall of the last two years exams as well. There's also recent session on exam lab questions, which are recurrent, or, I mean, asked again and again in the exams. Uh, part one is available currently. Uh, there are six videos on thyroid. The latest video which I had uploaded was on the nice thyroid cancer guidelines, case-based approach. Then there are around six videos on adrenal different topics, all the important topics covered for the exams. There is two very good sessions on lab endocrinology by Dr. Ben Murugan, my colleague. There is seven videos on uh, pituitary different topics uh, across the wide spectrum, diagnosis, treatment of Cushing's, interpreting pituitary MRI, very important for exams, acromegaly, apoplexy. There is a session on diabetes insipidus. Three videos on inherited endocrine syndromes, uh, there is uh, another six videos pertaining to uh, reproductive endocrinology, including this one, which is the full session. Uh, we have PCOS, we have uh, heart citizen virilization, evaluation management, congenital adrenal hypoplasia, transgender, gynecomastia. 
There are three videos on calcium metabolism where we have con uh, con and concluded in detail about guidelines for osteoporosis as well. There's a session on lipid disorders, very important session as well. And there is one session on pediatric endocrinology, which is Kalman syndrome, uh, approach to delayed puberty in uh, boys, uh, which includes Kalman and Klein printers as well. So, of course, uh, this is an ever-growing resource. And uh, if you'd like to subscribe, as I mentioned, please get in touch with me. Thank you so much. Thank you.